Welcome to CCTV Time Machine, where we take a look back at the CCTV archives and we look through the eyes of folks who are in those archives, who are on the, the tapes um, that we have there. And we have today Peter Clavel. It's great to be here, Megan. Thank Thanks. you for the Thanks. invitation. Yeah. And you've been here. You're familiar with CCTV. You know who we are. I, as I understand it, you have like 40 years of archives, right? Correct. And I've been around for all those years, so yeah. yes. Uh, I'm sure you can take me down memory lane, but uh, I think more importantly, CCTV, CCTV's done a remarkable job of recording Burlington's history starting shortly after uh, Bernie was elected mayor of the city of Burlington. So I think it's uh, amazing that you have not only have these archives, but you now have organized them where they're accessible. Yeah, well thanks to Nat here, who right. really was recording in and around Burlington, both things that his, kid was do his kids yeah. were doing, but also political activities and political actions, and then struck up a relationship with both Lauren Glenn Davidian and at the time Bernie. Nat and Bernie used to like go around right. and, and do a program called Bernie Speaks with the yeah. Community. And um, you know, Nat meticulously, like all of this stuff that you see behind me, he's got his handwriting. Yeah. Right. And I remember working here, it was like, I had to prove yeah. to Nat that my handwriting was worthy of being on the spines of the VHS tapes. <laughs> it's quite a legacy yeah. quite, and quite a gift that he left behind. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, there's been a lot of recordings over the years. Do you have them all archived? We have recordings from 1984 to the present. And um, we, anything that was a not a municipal meeting up until like 2015 or so, we would keep some of those. If there was something in yeah. particular that happened, there's a famous one where the city council goes back and forth, and Bernie finally has to be the tiebreaker vote. Right. They're trying to they're trying to elect the president, uh -huh. and they go. I think they had uh, 40 votes. Wow. Trying to finally elect a single president. So we kept some of those um, more notable meetings, but what's amazing is since 2015, we've kept everything that we've recorded. That's born great. digital um, and are in the process of making that accessible to everybody well. including digitizing all of the content but Peter you've lived here for a long time tell us a little bit about you grew up sure I was born in Burlington yeah uh, 74 years ago top of the hill was yeah. then the, the Gosebury Hospital I grew up in Winooski uh, and my ancestors on both sides of the family, both my fa mother and father, were uh, from Win well rooted in Winooski. So I go back about seven generations, yeah. I think. And your dad was politically involved in Winooski? My dad was, uh, yeah, on the fringes of political involvement. Uh, most notably, he served as a tax collector for the city of Winooski for 45 years. Yeah. Actually, being a delinquent tax collector and being a popular guy, those are, don't always happen okay. to come together, but okay. uh, he was he was both. But he and his brother, uh, when I was a young kid, owned a small grocery store in Winooski, Clavel Brothers Market, and uh, his brother Bob was involved uh, politically. Uh, he was on the Winooski City Council for a while, but probably most importantly, their uh, little market was a gathering place for politicos from around Chittenden County. They would gather in the, the back room and talk politics and drink a few beers and play cards and so, yeah. 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 Did, what, what, how, how, when did you know that you wanted to get involved with the work of, like sort of the political work and the people work that yeah. is politics? You know, probably one of my uh, early indications or early indicators of my being politically Interested happened in Winooski where as, as a young kid, uh, I don't know, maybe 11, 12 years old, I was elected mayor for the day. And so I spent a day uh, with the mayor and uh -huh. city manager and city clerk of Winooski uh, looking behind the scenes, seeing how the sausage was made. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I grew up here and I've known, of course, known you throughout the years and one thing that's always struck me is like a really good politician but a kind caring person you know people yeah. and I was like that guy <laughs> you know everybody's name yeah. and I feel like it comes from a genuine place of caring well thank you uh, it, it it does and 
You know, I came into Burlington politics from an unusual uh, path. I was the kid that grew up in Winooski across the river back then. Maybe even to this day, they called us river rats. And yep. Not many would have suspected that uh, one of the river rats would have swum across the river under cover of darkness and emerged as mayor of the city of Burlington. But my background before becoming involved in the Sanders administration was more as a manager, as a public ad administrator. Yeah. Uh, that was my educational background with a bachelor's degree in urban studies, then a master's degree in public administration. And uh, at the age of 23, I was a town manager in Vermont, in Castleton, Vermont. And then I returned home to my hometown of Winooski, where I served as a city manager for three years in the late 1970s. Yeah. And after that, I came across the river. Yeah. You're a deep people person, but a systems thinker, and we'll get into that a little bit in the yeah. international work that you've done. Let's, I mean, going back to Winooski, Winooski's a different place today yes. than it was when you grew up. Right. Now let's take a quick look at a piece on Winooski Urban Renewal. This is a compilation of some demolitions in downtown Winooski and um, some residents of Winooski filmed by Dan Higgins, who was also one of the founders of CCTV right. way back in the day. Put it down the hill a little bit. Yeah. I know, yeah. Well, it was one of the best eating places in town anyway. It sure was. It was open all night, right? Open all night long, yeah. All night. Yeah, crowd used to go in there. Yes. Now that's down on. That's uh, on the corner, isn't it? It's on West Allen, isn't it? Yeah. That's the Winooski block. And that one is. That's the American restaurant. Yes, See, they start there right. down. Yes, uh -huh. yes, yes. Sure. Uh huh. That's the team you played on, Claire? Yes, that's when she played. That's the that's diner. That's the diner. Yeah. Oh. Phil's diner, when they took it down. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. That was the best heating I place. I wish it was still back here. You, still, you wish it was still there, huh? Yeah. yeah. You could have put it down the hill a little bit. <laughs> it's all, look at that building. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't want to come down. <laughs> oh, you meant to work on that one. It will after a while. That's when they were two. Yeah. There it goes. Yeah. Isn't that <laughs> I know. We watched that before. But we live right across the street, so we yeah. didn't miss anything. That's either. right. You didn't miss nothing up there. That's right. What'd they do with all the all the people who had homes in here? I don't know. Yeah. I they paid uh, <coughs> paid them off and they bought new homes. Yeah, some of them got homes. And yes. We, we all got paid. I mean, Did you live in there? Yeah, I lived down on East Center. On East Center, yeah. and, then they, and then they just, yeah. the, the city said that they were going to buy it all up in mm -hmm. Domain? Yeah, they said they were going to tear it down and we'd have to move. I find places to move. Was there any, uh, I was always curious how the decisions were made for that. Was there any... Like, did neighborhoods get together to no. fight it? No, oh no, the urban renewal up? just said we had to move, and that was it. So, so the idea didn't come out of no. out of Winooski. It didn't come out of the people. I mean, you know, it came out of when the urban renewal came in. I mean, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Great. So, <laughs> what a meta experience. We're watching people mm. who are watching the right. film. So did you recognize any of those spaces or those people who were speaking? Well, I, I, I didn't know the people speaking, but I certainly knew the spaces. Uh, you know, I, over the years I had numerous paper routes in Winooski, and one of my paper routes as a kid was uh, delivering the free press to the urban renewal area, so I knew every building in that area. I also knew the bars in later years. I spent some time in those bars, but spent time in Bill's Diner and the building across the street that fortunately was saved from urban and oil destruction. What Winooski Block was the built by, yeah. right, was built in 1867 by uh, one of the developers of that building was my great-great-grandfather, Francis LeClaire. So, yeah, 
yeah. it all it all comes together and yeah. then I was be, became uh, city manager in Winooski in 1976 which was after the urban renewal had occurred but we had a large chunk of downtown Winooski that was vacant for many many years yeah then we had the audacity of saying well we're going to revitalize the 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 former mills of Winooski, which included the Champlain Mill, the uh, Woolen Mill, and also the Porter Screen Shop, and Porter Screen Shop on the east, uh, West Allen Street, uh, east, east Allen Street became senior housing, and I was working for the city of Winooski when we received an Ur Urban Development Action Grant, a UDAG, which helped with the renovation of the Champlain Mill uh, by Ray Pecor, so. Yeah. Yeah. You use the word audacity. Why we had the audacity? Well, it just was a very bold move to suggest that we're gonna renovate uh, 400,000 square feet of uh, mill space. It was, it was bold and it happened, not all on my watch, some of it happened after, but uh, it, it, it happened and, uh, you know, I'm pleased that those old mill buildings were, uh, were saved, yeah. uh, and one of one of those mills was the place of my grandparents, my father's parents, work for their entire lives. Basically, my yeah. grandfather quit school in the fourth grade to go to work in the woolen mill. Yeah. yeah, the and urban renewal, of course. So that story, well, a lot of that footage is obviously earlier than 1984. That was right. shot by Dan Higgins, and he actually had a camera in that Winooski right. Lock building. Um, shooting uh, time lapse of you know where now the Winooski mm -hmm. Circle is, right, and where CCV is built. Um, when yep. I grew up, it was a parking lot for years and years and years in front of the wo woolen mill, or the, the not the woolen mill, the uh, the Winooski Mill as yes. a shopping center. But that urban renewal story is also in the archives because it's told. Um, it happened downtown. It's where right. we're having the new buildings. Built yeah. and ironically, new streets brought back in. Right. Talk a little bit about how would something like that happen today? What was the process? Mm. You know the the urban renewal votes. It, urban renewal. It, it, it as I recall, it both in Winooski and Burlington, it did require a vote of the people. So it wasn't that that people weren't totally involved, but there wasn't much of an engagement of folks in the process and it was a wholesale demolition of entire neighborhoods both in Winooski and Burlington. And I don't think that would happen today. I think would be a little more discreet. Uh, some of the buildings were slums, were substandard and beyond the point of, of, of re being rehabilitated but others were very were sound uh, housing stock and some of them historical buildings that uh, should have been saved. I don't think that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, generally I think urban renewal was a failed e experiment mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, driven largely by the federal government and uh, big money being dangled out there uh, will make your city better yeah. and for most of them it's, it's debatable yeah. whether they emerged better. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to do a quick leap, but one of the things, you were the first, um, we're going to have your mayoral announcement, so let's not, let's go straight to the mayoral announcement and we'll, we'll keep everybody um, on the edge of their seat yeah. whether Peter is actually elected for mayor when he ran in 1988. <laughs> My name is Julie Davis and I'm here to welcome all of you to the Peter Pavel for mayor announcement party. Let's give a big hand to <laughs> about uh, Peter's candidacy for, for mayor just by knowing who Peter is, a really great guy with a great sense of humor. Um, but it's uh, a lot easier when I look around the room and see all the wonderful people who have come out here tonight in very cold weather to support Peter Clavel. Thank you very much. By the way, Peter is the only person I know who can console a distraught citizen, be thinking of some bold design or other and write a successful federal grant with his third eye all at the same time. Because of that skill, we have South Meadow, 
and we have a new complex on Riverside, and we will preserve Northgate as affordable housing. As I mentioned earlier, I've known Peter for many years, and to know Peter is to know Peter's family. Who here does not know Peter's parents, Mooney and Elle? <laughs> Peter's brothers, Peter's sisters, Peter's wife, Betsy, and of course, Peter's three children, Luke, Jay, and Will. It is not rare for Peter to conduct business meetings at his home, juggling a baby or two on his lap, nor is it uncommon to see him strolling Church Street on a Saturday morning with one, two, or three children in tow. Family and family values are important to Peter. And as mayor, he would initiate and promote ideas and programs to enhance the lives of Burlington families. We as a family are excited for him. Baby Willie gurgles a lot, <laughs> making political points to him at 5 o'clock in the morning. Jay wears her Clavel for mayor pin faithfully. She repeatedly points to it saying, Daddy-o, mine daddy-o. But it was Luke in his four-year-old manner who asked the question that will be answered on March 7th. Mom, he said, how far does dad have to run to get to be mayor? <laughs> the race will be long, but with all of your help, we can win. Please join me in welcoming Peter Clavel. There are people out there who are afraid of our vision, who are embarrassed by our accomplishments, and who grow tired of our resolve. They want progressive government out of City Hall, and they want progressive politics to be dead and to be buried. We cannot, we must not, we shall not, and we will not let them be successful in this endeavor. No way, progressive government is here to stay. I'm confident that Burlington will continue moving forward. We will not slip back to the old ways of the old days because we stand on the progressive side of history. Let us keep moving ahead with leadership that puts people first. And with your support, and with your help, and with the enthusiasm that you've shown here tonight, I hope to, and I will be your, your next mayor. Thank you. Hard to believe, 36 years ago, wow. Do you get what, I mean, what's your feeling when you watch that? Uh, my feeling is, man, how did I do this with three kids, the <laughs> oldest being four <laughs> years old? Thank you, Betsy, man, she did more than her share of the responsibility of caring for those kids while I, while I was out in the, the campaign trail. Well, and Will is politically involved today. He works for the city. For, yeah. Uh, on, on economic development, and uh, my son Luke uh, remains very much part of this community. And yeah. my daughter Jay lives in Rhode Island now. She married a, a firefighter. But uh, yeah, and the kickoff was at the at the community boathouse, which obviously had a special place in our heart. It was built only a couple of years earlier than that. And this was a a, a very uncertain time in. Uh, the city's history. I, I, I mean, many thought that Bernie's election initially was a fluke. And then they said, well, we'll just batten down the hatches and after two years, he'll be gone. Well, he surprised them and hung on for eight years. And when he left, he left on his own. It was his decision. He didn't lose an election. Nope. Uh, but then all the pundits were saying, well, that's the end of the progressive movement in Burlington. And I think uh, we surprised him a, a bit by uh, continuing yeah. The progressive run in the city of Burlington in 1988, that's the kickoff in December of 88. The election itself occurred in March of 1989. 
Yeah. And, and you were technically the first progressive mayor in Burlington because Bernie yeah. ran as an independent. Right? Bernie ran as an independent. In 1989, I recall that I ran as an independent. But okay. In subsequent elections, Okay. 91, I ran as a progressive candidate. At first, the progressive coalition nominee, then later the progressive party candidate. My last election, I also had the support of the Democratic Party. Yeah. The, the first woman who spoke, remind me her name, uh, Ginny? Ginny Wynn. Yeah. yeah. She's a tough cookie. She was so tough. So you got her endorsement. Yeah, she, she was a, a strong woman, and she, uh, she actually volunteered and uh, she, she headed up an effort to organize volunteers in the city. It was she worked at CVOEO, right. Champlain Valley Office yeah. of Economic good. Opportunity, Very and good. was a fierce advocate for uh, poor folks yeah. and a fierce advocate in Northgate. So you right. know, talk a little bit about that when she's talking about what well, you all did prior to being elected when you were working for CETA? Yeah, you know, I went to work uh, for Bernie shortly after he was elected. I was one of his first appointees for a brief period. I served as personnel director. Then in 1983, we created the Community and Economic Development Office. And after a national, nationwide search, I was selected as the director of CETA. Uh, and one of the responsibilities of CETA was, to, was affordable housing to preserve, protect, and produce more affordable housing. And at the time, it was interesting, uh, virtually all of the time that Bernie was mayor, Ronald Reagan was president. But we had some fairly substantial uh, programs supporting uh, cities at that time, including the Urban Development Action Grants, the so-called UDAGs, and another one called HODAGs, uh, Housing Development Action Grants. In Burlington, received more federal money than virtually any community of comparable size per capita. I think we came close to leading the the, the nation. Uh, but I one of that was your third eye that you used to write those grants. We, well, it wasn't just me. We had a dynamite uh, team in in in, in CETO. Uh, Some of those folks still around, like Michael Monte, he's still writing grants for affordable yeah. housing. John Davis, uh, yeah. Brenda Torpy. Brian, Brian Pine, Pine Bruce Seifert, yeah. Doug Hoffer, you know, yeah. a really dynamic team uh, working for CETO. But one of the efforts was uh, uh, Northgate, which uh, had benefited from federal subsidies. The federal subsidies were up, and the property could have been essentially uh, flipped into uh, ex more expensive condos. Uh, had spectacular location close to Lake Champlain. Yeah, that happened in Essex with right. the condos there. Right. It happened in other places. And we towns. said, no, we're not going to let that happen. Yeah. And so with Bernie as mayor, and at the time I was CETO director, uh, we put together a massive effort to uh, save Northgate, which involved uh, very complicated uh, financial transactions, but also putting uh, intense pressure on the developers, uh, telling them that no way, no how, are we going to allow you to convert this property? And yeah. so it involved financing and involved and created a condominium conversion ordinance. Uh, and there are a lot of pieces of it that all came together. And at the end of the day, we saved uh, uh, 336 units of housing, which would have been lost as affordable housing stock and continues to serve uh, this community well. 300, 336 families yeah. uh, continue to live out there at rents that they can afford. Uh, and they, it's a resident-owned. It, exactly. It's a resident-owned. Yeah. I mean, the story that I heard from somebody out there was we went from people who were relying on handouts to folks who, well, because of stable housing and because of the community, we were able to give back and donate yeah. to support our community. Uh, we've, um, I mean, to me, idealistically, this is the antithesis to the urban renewal um, type of government that right. we saw right. in that first clip. Yeah. So you're you're um, you become the mayor, and I think um, we have um, an interview with you here in the CCTV studios with Peter Frain. Um, so that's 1992. You've you're you've is this still in your first term as mayor? 1992. Uh, this would have been my second term. Second term. Okay. Um, so let's let's look at that clip and see Peter and Peter. Peter Frain. Whoa. Wonderful. We're going to go to your phone calls for the mayor, and I know there's probably a lot of issues. 
that you might imagine that you'd like to ask Mayor Peter Cavell about, and uh, we'll take care of that. I'm Peter Frayne, right now uh, a bi-weekly columnist for Vermont Times. It's good to be back. Bi-weekly. Bi-weekly, yeah. So Inside that means Track is back. Catchy name, it's back, yeah. Yeah, and I, I got a... There to trash politicians no, no, no. all persuasions I got a bone pick with you, Mayor, because as you know, well know, uh, we've talked recently, and uh, I, in fact, in my last column, had something nice to say about you. That was very unusual. <laughs> it was. And it, it didn't take but a few hours before I couldn't walk down Church Street without being buttonholed by people who said, hey, come here, Frayne, i got a bone to pick with you. <laughs> what is it? Well, who, maybe you think he's doing a good job as mayor, but, you know, I, I, I have never got such negative feedback from anything I've ever written yeah. as, uh, as that. It's amazing. Now, a lot of these people were, Welcome city, back. were city employees, yeah. <laughs> uh, some wearing the color blue, hint, hint, yeah. and uh, that was, I just thought I'd mention that. So don't expect any other kind words for, for some time. I'm okay. glad, glad to see that you're not the only one on the spot. Okay, okay. And good thing you're only bi-weekly. That's it. <laughs> My God, I'd run out of nice things to say quick. But uh, we have, let me see, I'm looking back there, and i got to say this, and you probably agree with me on this, having been in at Channel 17 over the years since its infancy. Wood furniture, can you imagine? I expect David Not Letterman. Not plywood, but hard wood. David Letterman is going to come out and tell me to move <laughs> over here in a second. It is really looking pretty good. We actually have, there are three technical people behind the camera, Yvonne, yeah. and uh, Nat Ayer is kind of acting like a producer. <laughs> Bill's in the back working on something else, but it's really looking very good, Channel 17 mm -hmm. looking very good. So let's start off. You can see on your screen the phone number for calls. I'm just going to throw a few questions to the mayor and just get, let's get up to date on a couple of things. First of all, Barge Canal. Question. Oh, so I guess if you want to hear what your answer, what the question was about the barge canal and what the answer was, we can go. So I probably said that the southern connector will be built next year. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm pleased to say that 36 years later, it is under construction. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That was that. Uh, so Peter Frain. Peter Frain, uh, remarkable political journalist, and uh, he was tough. Uh, you know, not only on me, but most of us in the, uh, most of us politicians of, of all stripes, he, he would give us a, a hard time and keep us honest and keep yeah. us on, his, on our toes. Yeah. Now, it was interesting that uh, I was in my second term here, about ready to launch a campaign for a third term. So about three months after that interview was recorded, I lost an election. Yep. Uh, in March of 1993. And it's not because you didn't plow the roads. Yeah, and I said, I'm done with it. I'm done with Burlington. I'm done with politics. And my family and I, kids were young at that time, ages 5 to 10. We packed up our bags and moved to Grenada, the Caribbean island of Grenada, for, for a year. Yeah. And... So it was a sabbatical of sorts, but while there I had some time to, uh, to reflect and think about what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, and I decided there's nothing I'd rather do than be mayor of the city of Burlington. Uh, and I came back after a year there. And, uh, I think you had to talk about why you lost that election. Yeah. He's going to talk about why. And was he referring, what's, the, what's he referring to when he's saying people were wearing blue? Uh, Do you remember? I don't remember. You know, I, I think back then Howard Dean was the uh, was the governor. Okay. And you know, Howard's a friend, and uh, in broad terms we get along. But we had our disputes over the years, and uh, this might have been yeah. uh, during one of those. That's uh, how our political system gets things done. Yeah. Is through disagreement, yeah. for better or for worse. That's right. And so. For Peter to hold your feet to the fire respectfully, but is, that's his job as yeah. journalist. But you ask about why I lost that election. Most people would say that uh, I took a position that at the time among many in the community was unpopular. And it's hard to think today that that position was domestic partners policy. It wasn't uh, uh, civil unions, it wasn't same-sex marriage, it was saying 
as a matter of fun as a matter of a fundamental issue of human rights and dignity and equity if you're a city employee and you have a partner we don't care if you're married we don't care if your partner is same sex that partner is entitled to the same benefits that the partners of other city employees would have yeah. and that you know, not everybody thought that was a good idea. And it, it brought. Before Vermont had it, approached right, the conversation around it, civil unions. And it reminded us that uh, back then there, there was and there continues to be a conservative segment of the Burlington population. And they came out and voted. Uh, and they, they all came out. And many of my folks that supported me assumed that I'd be reelected. I was a reasonably popular mayor and stayed home. And I lost an election to Peter Brownell. Yeah. And did Peter Brownell, I don't even remember it, but did he reverse the domestic, did he reverse that policy or did he keep it in place? Do you know? Uh, he did not reverse it. No. 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 Because no. he wasn't, nah. he wasn't yeah. a hard line social. No, he wasn't. I yeah. don't. It was interesting. I was just thinking at that time when I was out of office, I also took on my first uh, stint in an international development, which... Is that in Grenada or...? No, I traveled to, to Gaza. Oh, okay. I actually spent okay. five weeks in Gaza working on an assessment of the capacity of local governments of Gaza. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was an eye-opening experience. Yeah. And so, of course, today I follow what's going on there very closely, having a real sense of the, the community, this little place the size of four Vermont towns with 2.3 million people. Uh, I, I know it fairly well. Gaza, a place the size of four Vermont towns with 2.3 million people, yep. No infrastructure, no, yeah. no economy. Yeah. And you're in the archives. I mean, we are talking about the archives, but you are in the archives talking about Gaza. Yeah. And I just, yeah, talk about that. What is that to you to see that? Well, you know, you know I, Certainly, Hamas, their their attack was 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 brutal. Uh, it was incredibly violent, and uh, I understand uh, the need for Israel to to respond. And I think the world and Gaza would be a better place uh, without Hamas. Hamas, and uh, but the, going about it in a way that's going to that is resulting, as we sit here today, in, in the loss of so many. Innocent uh, yeah, lives, well uh, particularly yeah, particularly right. children. Yeah. Uh, it's got to be a better way to resolve conflict. Yeah, I feel like there's. Uh, yeah, let's let's move into the next clip. Um, it's a hard segue, but yeah. our next clip. So you came back, you um, ran for mayor again, and you were elected again. Yeah, it was a late. So Peter Brunel screwed I, up. I, I, I came right. I came back and uh, ran an election, and uh, one of the bumper stickers at the time said, "Even the hippies uh, pl plowed the streets." Uh, so the progressives. I never quite considered myself yeah. a hippie, but as a progressive, uh, some would characterize me as one. And uh, I think we did a reasonable job of providing basic services. And do you align with the term sewer socialism? I do. Yeah. Talk yeah. about that. Uh, it's just like making government work for for ordinary people and providing basic services, uh, yeah. whether it's uh, sidewalks or plowing the streets or providing uh, drinkable water or, or or sewers at a at, at a price that folks can afford. Yeah. yeah, so that you can implement policies that will be yeah. allow other folks uh, folks to live here yeah. affordable uh, housing. It's... Yeah. Um, then after, so after, so, you, yeah. so I came back and I, and uh, I went on to win five elections after losing that election, and uh, to be clear, sorry, I just want to be clear. Uh, Peter Brennell, there's a lot of Peters here. Right. <laughs> Peter yeah. Brennell had it was mayor for one term, and then uh, he had cut the plowing budget. Right. And so some streets didn't get plowed. We had like one of some of the worst snowstorms. Yeah. Right. And people were just fed up. Yeah. And they were like, "We need Peter Kovac back. He knows what he's doing." Yeah. So five, so five more terms. Five terms left. There were two-year terms. I, so I served a total of seven terms. 
uh, all two-year terms with the exception of my last uh, was a three-year term. Uh, uh, we reformed city, city government along the way and there was talk about going to a four-year mayoral term. Some folks thought that was too long, so there was compromise to go from two to three years. So it's now a three-year term yeah. for, for, for mayor. My last election was in the year two, 2003, and I left office on my own uh, in 2006. Yeah. Just as an aside, do you think Burlington's better off having a mayor? I mean, I know this is a charter issue, a mayor, or would you be better off with a city manager type government? I think that, you know, having been both a mayor and a city manager, I understand the, the benefits, the pros and cons of each. And I think in Burlington where you have a... Uh, uh, a population that's very engaged and uh, politically active. I think uh, the mayor as a chief executive makes sense, but I think you also need to support uh, the, the mayor with uh, uh, building managerial capacity within city government. And we did that in a couple of different ways. One is to create the position of chief administrative officer, which in some ways functions as a city manager. Mm -hmm. But we also gave the mayor for the first time the, the, the power to hire and fire uh, department heads. Yeah, which I think uh, many folks argued with you against, right. uh, argued against that yeah, back, because of this, the potential that, political swing. Yeah, and back in the day we had commissions that had that authority, and I used to say that when everybody's in charge, nobody's in charge. Mm -hmm. and so we, we moved to a place in Burlington where uh, we moved from a weak, weak mayor form of government to a strong mayor form of government. And yes, the mayor did have more power, but uh, the citizens could also hold the mayor accountable, which, yeah. which they do. Like I, I remember that. I remember yeah. being on the opposite side of that argument. Yeah. Was... <laughs> in, like a, in my in my grassroots political work. Mm. Um, let's move on to the governor's debate of 2004. So you run. For so I'm in my, I'm in my last term as uh, as mayor, being elected in 2003, and uh, you know having been mayor at this time for would have been a total of 15 years, but in my uh, 13th year as mayor. I said that, well, uh, you know, there needs to be some change uh, at, at state level. So many local initiatives are stymied by inaction at the state level, and I was particularly focused on uh, affordable health care. And I decided to r run for, for governor in, in 2000. Uh, in four, uh, I decided in 2003 to run, and the election was in 2004. Uh, it was it was tough, and I knew it would be. Uh, there's a real strength and in, uh, incumbency in the governor's office in the state of Vermont. There's only been one incumbent that's that, that's lost so in the history of the state. And, yeah. Was that uh, one Phil Hoff won? Right. Yeah. And so Jim Douglas had just been elected uh, governor, and at the time that I announced that I was going to run against him, uh, he had only been in office for for a year. Uh, so it was an uphill. Race. And you remember the central issues of that? By far, the the, the most uh, important issue was was health care. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, we had a we had a we did not. There was no Obamacare, and there was none of the work that no. Howard Dean went on or had done around uh, providing expensive. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I. You know, I wanted a system that everybody could participate in, uh, irrespective of how much uh, money you, you had. And, uh, you know, it obviously gets very complicated. And then if you move towards a system that is not financed by premiums that one pays, but financed by a system of taxation, uh, folks are always going to argue, oh, no, I can't have this. You're going to raise my taxes. Yeah. Well, we're going to raise your taxes, but we're going to lower your premium, and we're also yeah. going to create a system that's going to be fair and equitable, and everybody's going to have decent health care. And Vermont could have been a leader, but uh, uh, it, it, it didn't have the traction that it needed. Then later, when P Peter Shumlin pushed for universal care, uh, it didn't have the traction that it needed. Yeah. Yeah, well, it didn't have the trail. It, it's, it's expensive when you do it on a state basis, particularly yeah. a, a small state. Yeah. Uh, let's look at the governor's debate, 2004. This is you and Jim Douglas at the Farmer's Diner in Barrie, hosted mm. by Mark Johnson. I've heard of him. Yeah. 
The, uh, yeah. One of the questions that I asked the lieutenant governor's candidate was, uh, the candidates, was what you saw as the biggest problem 50 years from now in Vermont that something can be done about today to prevent. And uh, Governor Douglas, let me begin with you. 50 years from now, uh, obviously economic cycles are generally five to eight years, and, uh, and so probably that wouldn't uh, qualify for the half-century mark. I think it's uh, the natural environment of, of the state and how important it is for us to preserve for future generations. Uh, I launched a clean and clear action plan to address the uh, profound pollution that we have in Lake Champlain and other impaired waterways, and it's taken more than 50 years to get to this situation. It's going to take us a long time to get out of it. But if we uh, care about the next generations of Vermonters in terms of uh, maintaining the quality of our air and water, uh, I believe that that's a commitment that we have to begin, that we are beginning with the leadership of my administration right now. I mean, what's real important is that we be planning today to make certain that Vermont is a better place, better economically, better socially for our kids and our grandkids. That planning is not occurring within state government today. There is no vision for the future of the state of Vermont. We are ignoring problems. We are missing opportunities. We are ignoring the problem of the health care crisis. We are not addressing the energy needs of the state of Vermont. And the Douglas administration talks a lot about the environment in cleaning up Lake Champlain, but the investment that has been made has been minuscule. They've rolled out a plan that calls for a $150 million investment to address the phosphorus problem. And there's about $2 million of new state money in the budget. You can judge an individual's priorities by looking at the checkbook. Look at the state's checkbook that Jim Douglas has a responsibility for, and you will find that there's a lot of lip service to the issues and the challenges and the problems facing the people of the state of Vermont, but the investment that's necessary to address these challenges is not being made. Um, so that's, we're, half, we're to the halfway point from 2004 right. in that 50-year cycle. I'm just wondering, what, what does that stir up in you when you watch that? Mm. You know, to, to this day, I feel that uh, government needs to be more engaged. We need a more activist government, and we need to lead to tackle the tough issues of the day, uh, whether it's health care, whether it's environmental protection, or whether it's affordable housing. Uh, and I think we've had a number of governors that, that have, have not taken the tough positions and made the difficult choices and made the investments that need to be made to, for Vermont to be a better place. What was Jim Douglas like as an opponent? Oh, you know, I guess I'd like to for, forget that time. I, I mean, he was pretty uh, he's pretty smooth, you know, yeah. a good talker, but... Uh, I think Peter Frayne referred to he was surrounded by some young um, political operatives who were taking a playbook um, page out of Karl Rove's work, and he called them the trench coat mafia. Yeah, or um, they so were also called. Over the coals they were also moment, called yeah. the nasty boys. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. got raked over the coals during that campaign, yeah. so I can understand not wanting to revisit it. But so thanks for <laughs> watching. <laughs> Um, let's move on to some of your international work, which is probably near and dear to your heart. You did work in, of course, you've mentioned Gaza. You spent that time in Grenada, but it wasn't just a vacation for your family. No, not at all. I very much uh, threw myself into uh, the Grenadian community and became involved in a campaign of an individual who was running for prime minister at the time. He went on to be elected and served for geez, 20 years as, as Prime Minister of Grenada. Of Grenada. Uh, but while being mayor, I also, you know, had the opportunity to experience Burlington's foreign policy. And again, uh, you know, Bernie was mayor during the Reagan administration, and uh, we very much disagreed, many of us disagreed with the Reagan foreign policy, but we took actions to discuss the implications of that foreign policy on the people of Burlington and on our national budget, but we also decided to enter into uh, relationships with folks uh, that sometimes would be characterized as our enemies by then President Reagan. So, you know, the first relationship was with Portica Basis, which when the government was supporting the Contra War, Burlington said, well, 
we don't agree with with the fun with with the funding of the contras, but let us get to know the the uh, people of Grenada of uh, Nicaragua on a, on a personal basis. So in 1983, yeah. uh, Burlington and Puerto Cabezas, also called Bilwi, entered into a sister city program. Uh, a few years later, uh, we partnered with Yaroslavl Russia. And uh, then in the early 90s, uh, we entered into a relationship with uh, a Palestinian community, uh, Bethlehem. Yeah. And uh, there, there was some objections to that. And we ended up uh, creating a tri triangular relationship involving a Palestinian community, uh, Israeli community, Arad, and Burlington. Uh, and then later, there's been additional sister cities created, including yeah. Enfleur, France. But uh, I visited each of those communities uh, five or six times. Uh, the, the, the foundation of Burlington sister city programs is people to people exchanges. And there were many remarkable exchanges over the years. I'm pleased that the sister city programs remain intact. I'm disappointed that they're not as active as they once were. And anybody who's watching this that wants to be engaged uh, in a meaningful way and wants to better understand and learn about people from the interesting places around the world, I would encourage you to get involved in a sister city program. Yeah, the, yeah that people to people place and specifically Puerto Cabezas was chosen because it was a place that was not necessarily a Sandinista stronghold. Right. It was, and I mean, I think right now, um, San, uh, you know, uh, Ortega is not, um, right. is, is no, is no walk in the park kind guy. No. <laughs> he's it, really changed um, the Sandinistas into, he's changed the Nicaraguan government in a way. Um, right, and this is an area populated by indigenous people, the Mosquito Indians, and uh, they historically have not been uh, necessarily aligned with the Sandinistas. Yeah. They've had their own party, Yatama, and uh, they're suffering as a result of that today. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we just learned about the um, the Yadama leader right. who was arrested and taken to uh, Managua. Right. And, um, you know, you talk about going to visit the sister city. So let's watch this clip. Um, I will say you've had relationships, mayor to mayor relationships. Right. You brought the Little League, Burlington Little, Little League down. You brought the Little League team up here. It was a massive that's, undertaking. Yes. Yeah. But that's that idea that we are world citizens. I mean, I think back to the co-op had a third world surcharge on things like sugar yeah. and other products. So we were recognizing mm. our relationship as community members right. in, to, in the rest of the world. Um, let's watch this clip and then let's think about that um, relationship a little bit. In 1984, the city council proclaimed Burlington, Vermont to be the sister city of Puerto Cabezas. This port community of 20,000 people is on the isolated Atlantic coast of Nicaragua. Welcome. Welcome. I think that what this is about, a sister city relationship between Burlington and a similar type city in Nicaragua is of extraordinary importance through visits with Nicaraguan, welcoming Nicaraguans here, through contributions of medicine, educational material, agricultural material, we will be able to stand up definitively for peace and for the needs of the people rather than for war and destruction. And I think it's a very exciting event and I hope that the people of Burlington will respond enthusiastically about that. Yes! I'd like to send warm greetings to the people of Burlington. And I would like to let them know that we feel satisfied to be their sister city. And that we will be able to exchange not so much the giving of uh, materials and money for projects, which we do need, but more important, uh, very clear, humane relationship. People becoming friends with us from Burlington, Vermont, and we becoming friends with them.
then there are the people who have benefited from port from people coming here like i think some of you might remember i think it was three years ago the dancers who came neko and the dancers from puerto cabezas came and and performed in a dozen or so schools in the area here this difference between a sister city program that only uh, manages relations between the, the city councils and a sister city program like this that brings people together. How would you like to explain that a little to the people? Because sometimes it's confusing and people would believe that a sister city program is only with the alcaldia. And we, the people, don't have anything to do with that. But this has been a different experience. I give regards to my people them in Vermont, yes. Burlington, the whole hemispheric of that place, that we love them. And every time they visit us, we feel good. It, you all make us feel alive again, make us feel good, because we are a sister city, you know. Mm, great. Yeah. What, yeah. Do you, what, do you, what do you see when you look at that? You know, I see the sister cities as being an opportunity at a time when this world is very troubled, when we face huge challenges, things are complicated. It's a way to get to know folks on a very personal level and to understand their life and uh, exchange ideas and hopes and aspirations and uh, understand that we don't have all the answers, but we've made mistakes that we can share with folks, and sometimes they can avoid those mistakes. But it's been a very, in, in Burlington, our relationship with, with sister cities have been very equitable, have mutual, and I think that uh, we benefited uh, from them, and they've benefited from us. I think it's been a wonderful uh, exchange, and it's also whet my appetite for. Uh, world affairs and international issues. Uh, I went on after being mayor to pursue a career in international development, uh, working on USAID projects for a Burlington-based company. It was ARD, it's now called Tetra Tech, uh, which was, I, I found very uh, rewarding and uh, interesting. Uh, took me to some interesting places, including Afghanistan, South Sudan, and actually lived in Albania for four and a half years. So, yeah. uh, and more recently, I've served as uh, chair of the board of the Vermont Council on World Affairs, which has been another way to uh, deepen my understanding of uh, world affairs and uh, the, the people that inhabit this world. We're coming up on a mayor's election. Mm. There's Bernie Sanders as the mayor standing on the City Hall steps talking about the importance of sister city relationships to bring about peace, understanding, yeah. but also to, you know, push back. Are we going to see anybody? Is that even possible to have that kind of um, talking points in today's uh, political arena? I th certainly think it is, and I'll be interested to see if the mayoral candidates even mention this as being one of the, uh, the areas of interest for them. I mean, you've got to uh, have strong values that understand. You have yeah. to have strong values that underpin beyond yeah. just trying to make things better. Right. Right? Seeing I mean, ourselves in a global context. I know one of the things that's being pursued now is to establish a sister city in Ukraine, uh, yeah. which I think would be a very interesting and meaningful way to better understand the, what the folks in Ukraine are, are facing, the challenges they face, but also provide them support. Yeah, because we see a little bit, and I did get the pleasure of going to Nicaragua with Dan and Jane mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. visiting and doing an exchange, bringing some uh, television production work and learning from folks there. And it's, you know, you can watch it and get, get a sense from looking at it on television, right. but 
it's different than being there. I think maybe no. so much of our experience is mediated. And these these, these programs have, have changed my life and my outlook yeah. on the world. And my guess is the same for you. I, I don't know of many people that uh, have immersed themselves in one of the Sister City programs that hasn't been profoundly impacted yeah. by that experience. Yeah. Well, that's a little trip through our CCTV archives, oh. memory lane. Is there anything that we didn't show today that you're wondering about it that's in our archives? <laughs> There's a lot there, yeah. Anything yeah. that comes to mind that you think of? Uh, to dive a little deeper into that election that I lost, then to come back two years later would be, uh, would be interesting. Yeah. Uh, also to uh, understand some of the the battles of the day, uh, some of the successes, but some of the learning points along the way. I'm thinking specifically about the waterfront. Uh, so much happened on the waterfront in yeah. my political life, both in CETO and uh, later as mayor in, in terms of the, the purchasing of the waterfront, the removal of the tanks, the development of parks, the boathouse, bike paths. The argument between the Greens the, and the Progressives. Exactly, and the yeah. Democrats right. and the, so. yeah, going to court. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of stories that can be told from the archives. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many stories and lessons to be learned, too, about, about uh, housing and you know, continues to be a challenge that uh, Burlington and cities across this country f face. But I think sometimes people are not mindful of what has been done in Burlington and the fact that so much of our housing stock today remains affordable because of the programs that have been put in place, whether it's the uh, Community Land Trust now, Champlain Housing Trust, or the Section 8 Housing Program, which pegs your rent to... Uh, Income uh, Burlington has done some remarkable things, and I think sometimes those those accomplishments are are lost sight of. Um, thank you, Peter, for joining us. Megan, today. thank you very much yeah. for the invitation. Yeah, and uh, thank you all for watching. If you want to dig into the CCTV archives um, further for yourself, www.cctv.org. And if you need help finding anything, just let us know and we will look for it in our shelves.